Mm, hello, and welcome to episode 26 of Curiosityness. I'm Travis DeRose, the host of this show, and uh, thanks for being here. This episode was pretty fun for me. I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I do because I have on uh, Mal Pearson from, he has a website called Makes That Didn't Make It which he basically writes the stories and documents all of the car makers that have gone under or like or orphan cars and, and that kind of stuff. So cars like uh, DeLorean, you've probably heard of, who doesn't exist anymore. A bunch of car makers like that, like the Tucker, the Bricklin, which I used to own. Um, so he, we just, it's really fun. We kind of just go through and, and talk about a few different car companies who just had cool ideas to start with and had fun, you know, upstarts and ideas and cars, but then just didn't make it for whatever reason. And, um, I think if you enjoy cars and, or if you just kind of enjoy, you know, fun stories like this, like the, uh, the American spirit of, of starting a car company, um, I think you'll really enjoy this episode. It, <laughs> Mal is just so fun to talk to because he knows so much about all this stuff. So, uh, without further ado, here is the episode. All right, Malcolm, how's it going? Hello, Travis. How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for being on the show, Mal. Well, so you sure. have uh, your website. What's your website called? It's called Makes That Didn't Make It. Makes That Didn't Make It, man. I would like this whole morning and basically yesterday, I've just been on that site like constantly it's so fun to read about all these stories so it's i guess how would you describe it to somebody who doesn't know what that what your site is or who just came upon it well makes that didn't make it are uh are it, it we i look at american car brands that are no longer with us um and many people call them orphan brands in fact there's a whole uh there's a whole uh, uh annual orphan car show in ypsilanti michigan uh, that I went to last year, and uh, where all the all the owners of these crazy old brands who are no longer around uh, get together and show off their car and get together, and it's basically it's a, a place for car geeks to to get together. Right. Um, and what I I am more I'm not so much a car collector. I I, I don't have a, a classic car, um, but I'm a writer, and I like um, I like writing about something that's no longer around because the uh, it's gone. No more, no more of these cars. No more Edsels or no more Pontiacs or no more Studebakers being made. So uh, the story's been told, um, or the story's done, and it, it's just waiting for me to tell it. Mm -hmm. That's what I do on this website, and I try to do uh, do it in a way that's uh, that both informs and hopefully delights as well. Yeah, totally. Well, I think. You definitely accomplished it, Mal. It's it's so fun to read this stuff because these stories are they're pretty cool. There's so much that goes into all these things, and um, we had talked before. I actually owned when I was kind of I was probably 16 when I bought the I bought a Bricklin SV1, which probably nobody listening to this really knows about. But that is you know it's it's considered an orphan car company, right? Well, it's a car company that uh, now you look like you're a young guy, so uh, you were probably uh, born after the SB1 was made. Yeah, um, it was made in. Uh, it, they started. Uh, it was announced in 1973. Mm -hmm. uh, they started production in 1974, and it lasted. They made three, almost 3,000 of them, before going out of business yeah. in 1975. And as you know, it's just a cool. It, it was. It was built in the, when it first came. Out in 1974 as the first uh, safety sports car, mm -hmm. and the 1970s. The 1970s were not a good time to be a, a, a car guy. Um, and I was uh, I was just barely a teenager at that time, and you know we had federal regulations uh, that uh, that choked off uh, performance with emission control uh, regulations that choked off performance, and uh, safety regulations that hung. Massive, ugly bumpers, uh, uh, crash bumpers onto onto cars. Yes. And as I was a teenager, and I'm looking around, not yet having my driver's license, I was starting to get the sense that there were. By the time I got my driver's license, there weren't going to be any cool cars to drive. <laughs> and uh, so that's when uh, a fellow by the name of Malcolm Brick Bricklin, who was an entrepreneur from Florida, um, announced this uh, this this 
new gull winged safety sports car. And to me, as a 14 year old, I just thought this was the, the, just the coolest thing in the world. Uh, and maybe that there was hope after all. And well, if you bought one, uh, you know that it, it had its problems. Oh yeah. Um, uh, the, the main one was uh, the doors that uh, that occasionally stopped working. Which, <laughs> I don't know if that if that happened to you. No, maybe I, it was started out in a used car. You know, maybe maybe the owner uh, had gotten that those problems worked out, but they were not worked out when the when the car hit the market. No, and of course and those, that, they were originally. Um, what were they like? How were they powered originally? Do you remember? Uh, they were hydraulic powered. Hydraulic, that's right. And so they're hydraulic they're automatic. Powered. They're not like the DeLorean where you just lift them up. They're you press a button and they go up. And they would take hydraulic like ten powered. seconds to open, right? Well, yeah, and it's it's sort of like the uh, like the Tesla uh, Model X now. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Forty five years later, and they've worked out some of the glitches, or at least I think they've worked out some of the glitches. Yeah. Um, I, but uh, but back then they hadn't, and. Uh, and so uh, I think the problem occurred is if you tried to open both doors at the same time, so you've got a passenger, the driver and passenger tried to work their doors at the same time, it would short out the system. Oh, uh, okay. And the cars also had a problem with uh, leaky seals. So if you happen to have been caught in a rainstorm and your door shorted out, you might have the experience of, uh, of what it might be like in a World War II submarine after it was, uh, after it was hit with depth charges. <laughs> I don't think there were any reports of of, uh, of drivers or passengers drowning in their cars, but it might have they might have come close. I don't know if that happened. You're in Southern California, so maybe not. <laughs> no, I'm good. And mine mine uh, was converted to. There's kind of like an aftermarket uh, air powered system. So mine weren't. Um, they were just all pneumatic. So they would open up a lot quicker um, and close a lot quicker. It was it was a much better system to just have them air powered. Well, the air-powered system is how they originally wanted to do it. Oh, and, okay. Uh, and the original designer uh, was a guy named Herb Grass, and uh, he wanted to do uh, the air-powered. I think it's uh, pneumatic-powered. Yeah. Um, and the uh, the owner of the company, Mr. Brooklyn, uh, just thought hydraulics. Somebody had told him that, hydro- why don't you try your, uh, putting hydraulics to your car? That would be really cool. And he thought that would be a cool idea. So he, he had, had them change the design to hydraulics. And uh, they didn't really have time to work out the bugs. Uh, <laughs> but apparently, yours yours was the original way, which which is the way it should have been, and uh, apparently it works. That's that's a good thing. Yeah, that's that's interesting that they but not, their not original for, idea worked better. You know. Well, it's the engineers who uh, who Brooklyn had hired to do the cars. They they knew what what worked, but um, as many. Uh, Brooklyn was a was an entrepreneur and he was a salesman, but he really didn't know anything about engineering. Mm-hmm. And so just, but he got an idea of a, a cool idea in his head. And he just wanted to go with it. And yeah, that was the downfall of uh, of the car. It's actually a downfall of mine. Same sort of thing happened with the with the, the Tucker. Which I'm, I'm sure you've, heard, you've probably heard of the Tucker. I've heard of the Tucker. Yeah, that had the. Did there it was have... a movie about it? Frank Ford Francis Ford Coppola made a movie about it in the eighties. Okay. Uh, and it was a, a, a revolutionary car 19, in 1948 uh, that uh, was going to change the way uh, America looked at the automobile. And uh, he was another guy. He was a, a, a salesman, and a, uh, he had an idea for a, for a car, and he went with it. But some of the ideas just didn't work out. And, of course, when an idea doesn't work out and you're starting up a company, uh, that costs money. And uh, startup companies don't have a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And the uh, spells the end. So, uh, what was um, what did he? What was unique on that Tucker? Do you remember like some of the things that he was putting on that that really wanted to like? How was he going to change the automobile? Well, the Tucker in forty eight was a was a rear. It was a it was a standard size car, but it was a rear engine car, and uh, it had a horizontally opposed six cylinder engine and uh, um, fully independent suspension. It had. Uh, uh, a third headlight in front that would uh, that would turn and illuminate the corners as you it would turn when you turn the steering wheel it would turn that center that's right headlight. yes yeah I remember so that corners um, it uh, it was also considered a safety car he had uh, but they didn't know much about safety <laughs> safety feature was uh, the fact that it had a, a compartment 
um, down below the dashboard that you, you felt you saw yourself going into a, a crash, you could uh, dive down to this compartment to protect you from being uh, thrown out the thrown through the windshield. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no reports. They only made fifty of them, so there were really no reports where that worked out so well. Yeah, but uh, it was certainly an interesting idea. Yes, for sure. Yeah, it's funny all the all the like oh, using see. safety as like a a selling point, you know. Yeah, and back then it didn't really work so well. Um, mm. I know they tried they tried using safety as a Ford Motor Company tried using safety as a selling point in the fifties. Uh, by by offering seatbelts as an option on their cars, <laughs> and apparently consumers thought, well, if you need to put seatbelts in a car, there must be something wrong with the car. So I don't I, I don't want to buy this car. Yeah. So they found that uh, that uh, safety was not a selling point back then. <laughs> That's so weird. Oh man, that's how I was able because I was you know uh, when I was sixteen, I had to kind of convince my my parents to let me get a Bricklin, you know, kind of this like older 1975 car and that's like how i made the case to my mom that it was it was a good car for me to get was because it was a safety vehicle you know it had the five mile per hour bumpers on it and it had a full-on roll cage integrated into the body and everything and uh she bought it she she believed me i guess so i I was able to get one and that was the uh that was the first car ever to have a a fully integrated safety cage Yes. Oh, that's right. It's a groundbreaking car. Now, of course, it's uh, federally mandated, but mm-hmm. 45 years ago, it was not. Yeah. New idea. And that car was really heavy because of that. And the I, the doors, too, before we had them working, to open, the doors were like 100 pounds to lift up the gull wings. It was, like, ridiculous. Yeah, but, boy, it was a good-looking car, though. It sure was. It was pretty fun to have that thing. I had a, the orange one, the safety orange color. Oh, and... Yeah, I mean, I bought that thing not running. Me and my dad fixed it up, got the air doors working and everything. But yeah, that thing was pretty fun to drive around in and see people look at, you know. Now, I'm curious, how much did you pay for it back then? I think I, what did I pay? I think I paid like four, four thousand, five thousand, something like that. Now, it's one of those cars that I, I keep I keep an eye out for. It's always been a favorite of mine. I keep an eye out for it. And I just saw a couple, uh, one of them last month that just sold for 15,000 bucks. Oh. And another one this month, well, November, uh, sold for almost that amount. Huh. So they're, Were those... they're, they're picking up in popularity. Yeah, interesting. Now, I think people like you are just attracted to, hey, this is something different. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's really what the makes that didn't make it. That's what this website is about. And what I do is because uh, orphan car brands are something different, something you don't see very often. Um. Everyone is attracted to cars like the Mustang and the, the Corvette and the 57 Chevy, and and those are always going to bring high dollars at, at auction. Um, mm. But the the more unusual brands don't bring those kind of prices, and people some of the speculators aren't quite so interested in it. But uh, more eclectic people um, gra- gravitate gravitate towards it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like a. It is a cheaper way to get a car that really is going to grab people's attention and and turn some heads. Like I would take, I took my car to um, some car shows and it was just, it attracted everybody because no one's ever seen it before. No, no, no. And that's, that's one of, that's one of the attractions to to all these cars is, uh, you know, people want something, people want something different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. It's, they are fun to own. I, I, I wish I still had that thing, but it was just, um, it was an old car, so it wasn't the best to drive, you know, compared to modern stuff. So it wasn't good for like a daily driver and I didn't have a spot for a second car really. Um, and the other thing was I couldn't, I'm six one six two, and I just couldn't fit in the Bricklin. Like I put the seat as low as I, it would go. It wasn't even really adjustable, but we kind of changed out the bolts and stuff. And I just, my head would rub against the top. And then when those, you know, I'd have to lean in and duck down every time the doors came down just so I wouldn't get, you know, knocked in the head by them. So it wasn't the the best fitting car for me, but yeah, it, it was fun to have while I, while I had it for sure. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. That's yeah. cool. It's good stuff. It's fun to do this. Um, so yeah, what was that? What was the uh, Orphan Car Show? Was it was just full of kind of the cars on your website there? So Ypsilanti, Michigan. It, it takes place every year in September in Ypsilanti, Michigan. I think I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, <laughs> Ypsilanti with a Y. 
Um, and uh, Ypsilanti is the home, is the birthplace of Preston Tucker, who oh. uh, talked about was the inventor of the Tucker. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it is also the place uh, he uh, it was a place that uh, Kaisers were were built. Kaiser was uh, you've heard of Kaiser Permanente, the healthcare company, mm-hmm. and that came out of uh, out of building Hoover Dam uh, back in the in the Depression. And uh, it was to, to, to create uh, healthcare for the uh, for the workers at the Hoover Dam. And oh. Henry J. Kaiser was this engineer who built Hoover Dam. And uh, and then during World War II, he started building Liberty ships, uh, which were the, the cargo ships, the transport ships that that supplied uh, in Britain during the Battle of Britain, um, and then supplied the U.S. forces in Europe. Uh, and they were able to build. Uh, these massive uh, cargo ships uh, in a week, one week's time, they could build a ship. Wow. And so Henry Kaiser was somewhat of a, he was sort of an industrialist hero. You know, back then during World War II, uh, industrialists were considered to be heroes when they were, uh, you know, serving our country and serving the war effort. Um, and he had a, he had a, a pretty good ego on him and, and rightly so. He accomplished quite a lot building dams and, you know, supplying uh, these ships. Mm-hmm. Uh, he decided that um, automotives, automobiles were the uh, the future of transportation, and he decided that he could get into uh, building building cars uh, and could go up against the big three: General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. Uh-huh. And so he bought this um, this uh, uh, army surplus. It was a, it was a, a plant that built uh, uh, B seventeen bombers. Um, of course, when the war was over, they didn't need to build bombers anymore. So Henry Kaiser bought this plant and uh, decided to build cars in it. And uh, that lasted about eight or nine years. And then that he found out that he, could, he couldn't do it. Uh, and so General, General Motors bought the plant. And they started building, eventually built the Corvair there. Um, and these were all, these are all cars that were built in. So Tucker, uh, the, the Kaiser, and the Corvair, they, were all, they all came out of Ypsilanti. So Ypsilanti uh, decided to make their name for themselves by becoming the orphan car capital of the world. <laughs> nice. They hold, they hold this show there every year, uh, every September, uh, where people from around the Midwest, most of the Midwest, um, gather with their orphaned cars and uh, and show them. And I got a chance to go last year, and it was uh, and it was quite the treat. Uh, yeah. To see all these these fabulous old cars, I think Edsel was the uh, was the featured brand that year. Oh, Edsel, yeah. What's yeah. the? I mean, I don't know. Edsel's kind of like a, um, I don't know, like a that name just kind of lives in infamy because it was a. Do you know like the whole story with the Edsel and everything? Well, Edsel was uh, was a car that the uh, the Ford Motor Company in the in the nineteen fifties. In the 1950s, General Motors and uh, General Motors had five different brands: they had Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, and Cadillac. And the theory was that uh, a customer could start off when they're starting out in their career and buy an inexpensive Chevy. And as they as they moved up and, and their income increased, they could move up to a Pontiac and then an Oldsmobile and a Buick, Cadillac, um, and move up the as they moved up the income scale. They could move up the uh, the automotive status scale. <laughs> okay, but Henry Ford, um, old Henry Ford, who, who invented the Model T, mm-hmm. uh, decided he was a, a rather arbitrary, uh, cantankerous old fellow, and he decided that uh, people didn't need anything more than a Model T. It was basic transportation, and who needs more than basic transportation? Mm-hmm. And for decades, he fought against um, having. Uh, uh, a more luxurious, uh, more luxurious brand. He allowed his son Edsel Ford. Son, his only son was named Edsel Ford. Um, he allowed Edsel Ford to have a a, a plaything called Lincoln, uh, the Lincoln brand. Yeah, and he could design this uh, luxurious Lincoln brand, uh, but Henry wouldn't allow anything in the middle. Uh, and Edsel spent his whole life fighting for uh, for uh, for a, a mid range car. He finally got the Mercury in right before World War II, um, and then afterwards, Ford you know, needed something else. They felt General Motors had five brands, and Ford only had three, and they needed something else to bridge that gap. Uh, and so they they created the Edsel, uh, and it is a 
an example of a car that was uh, <laughs> rather ill. It was a good idea when it was conceived, but three years later, when the car actually hit the market, the market had shifted and uh, it led, left Edsel in sort of a lurch. <laughs> uh, it was introduced in 1958, and 1958 was uh, was the start of the probably the worst economic downturn in the United States since the Great since the Great Depression. Mm-hmm. Uh, so people weren't in the mood to buy a, a new, fancy, expensive car. And uh, and I don't know if you remember the Edsel, or you can picture the Edsel. It was a rather strange looking car as well, and uh, a lot of people were turned off by its looks. <laughs> It was also a much hyped car. Uh, they uh, promoted it as being as being something you know almost from out of this world. I mean, some some people actually thought this car might fly. It was such a they were it was such a hype about about this extraordinary new car. And when they went into the showrooms to have a look at it, you realized it really wasn't all that different from any other car. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, being it was it was introduced with, in a in a, in a depression, um, it, it it didn't make it. Yeah, and it failed, and it is probably the most. Uh, is there a dog barking in the background? There is. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, my do- my dogs hear that and they're going a little crazy too. So. Oh my god! <laughs> wow. Yeah, she should stop in a second. That's my my dog. I got her. No, right. no <laughs> of course, got my dog to go outside and look and see what's out there. <laughs> but uh, Anyway, so the so the, uh, so the Edsel is, is probably the most uh, is, is probably the most famous of uh, of the makes that didn't make it because um, it uh, it failed so spectacularly. Yeah, and really. Cost, I think it cost for the equivalent of about modern equivalent of about three billion dollars. Wow. wow. So was Edsel was it like one model of car or was it a whole new make that Ford came out with? Well, back in the 1950s, um, there really weren't a lot of different models. Every uh, a brand like Ford had one car. Uh, Chevrolet was one car. There were different oh. versions of it. There were different uh, different levels of trim. But if you peeled off the skin, it was just really the same car underneath. Oh. Uh, and so they introduced a different car. They introduced uh, a whole new brand uh, with a whole new dealer body, and it was uh, it was extremely expensive to to do. Um, and starting in around 1960, they, they pretty much stopped doing that. Um, they started just introducing different models under the, the brand name. Like Ford had one car, but in 1960, uh, they introduced the Compact Falcon. Uh, so now they had two, and then they introduced the Mustang, and then it was off to the races. And there were no need. There was no need for a lot of these uh, a lot of these other brands. These oh, other- okay. Yeah, I didn't I didn't realize that, but that makes sense. And then it was kind of because then it got, um, I don't know, almost too crowded. Because it seems, because hasn't uh, GM and Ford gotten rid of a lot of their brands like Mercury Hello? and stuff now? Yeah, General Motors had five brands, and they're down to uh, they're down to three now. Um, much uh, General Motors always had a ton of money, and so they could, even if something wasn't working, uh, they were. Uh, very reluctant to change the way they did business. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, it led to their downfall, their, yeah. their bankruptcy. And to, uh, to kill off a brand. They finally did so in 2003. They killed off the Oldsmobile brand. Yes. Um, poor old Oldsmobile. When you're, when you're, when you're, it's, it's, it's hard to appeal to new young buyers when your name is Oldsmobile. <laughs> but it was. They didn't call it Oldsmobile because it was old. It was a fellow by the name of Ransom Olds uh, was the inventor of the Oldsmobile. Mm-hmm. And when General Motors acquired it, they they kept the brand, and it was uh, and they built Oldsmobiles for more than a hundred years. They built thirty seven million of them, um, and so General Motors didn't want to let go of that brand, but customers didn't, consumers didn't want it anymore. Yeah, um, it became too expensive to uh, to hold on to it. And uh, and that was the case. Uh, it was the case for Mercury in 2010 when Ford uh, canceled the Mercury. Um, it was the case with Pontiac. Uh, I mean, that's the way that that when the big three uh, eliminated one of their brands, that was uh, that was pretty much the reason. People just there was no room for it in the market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think I don't know. At least for me, and I'm sure everybody just realized that they were 
you know, between like Ford and Lincoln and Mercury, they were all the same. It was the same car, just with different trims, basically. If you peel off the bodies, the bodies look very different. But if you peel off the body, it's really the same car under the under the surface. Yeah. You go down to your Lincoln dealer and you look at that new uh, Lincoln. Uh, I think it's called an MK MK uh, Z. Um, and if you peel off the skin, it underneath it's the same thing as a Ford Fusion. Mm-hmm. It costs thousands of dollars less. Yeah. You no, know, it has a lot more fancy equipment and uh, looks very nice. It's a beautiful looking car, but there's not that much different under the surface. It's all, it's all, it's really all marketing. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Huh? Occasionally someone will come up with something, something brand new and something uh, new and exciting. Like, uh, well, like the Hummer, for instance. Yeah. <laughs> there's nothing else like the Hummer. And, uh, that was introduced, that was introduced in 1992. Um, it's actually it, you've heard of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Ar- when Arnold Schwarzenegger, before he became governor of California, he was a you know he was an action movie star, and he was uh, filming a movie called uh, Predator. I don't mm-hmm. know if you've seen that. It's one of one of my favorites. Um, and they had he he discovered and and the Hummer was a, a military vehicle used by the army. It was that giant that giant thing that you saw in Desert Storm. Yep. Uh, and Arnold really liked it, and he wanted to buy one, but you couldn't. You, you they weren't for sale to the public. So he convinced uh, American Motors, who owned Hummer at the time, um, he spent years yacht lobbying them to build uh, to sell this car to the, to the public. And finally, they yielded to him, and they and they did. And he promoted <laughs> the car, free promotion, um, and this you know big movie star promoting the car for free. And you know, that was uh, that was tough to. That was tough to turn their back on, yeah. And uh, and it worked, and it, it just happened to be that time when uh, when people were wanting you know something bigger and better. Um, and then General Motors bought the rights to Hummer, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, started expanding the brand. Um, and it did quite well for a few years um, until the economic uh, until the the, the two thousand and eight uh, uh, Great Recession, and then people stopped buying cars like that. And uh, and when GM went bankrupt, it was a it was an easy choice to uh, to stick Hummer in the in the dustbin. Yep, man, that is. So, how long was that? When did Hummer become like a available to consumers again? In 1992. Okay, so they were around for what 15, 16 years. About 15 years, yeah. 15, okay. 16 years. That's longer than I thought it was, but it was a while. Wasn't it a while till they started selling like the H two and H three? And the H two, they came out with that in uh, in the late nineties, and that was the first. That was a General Motors. Uh, it was basically a General Motors pickup truck under the uh, under the surface. Yeah, but you know, it sure. I don't know if it looked good, but it it sure looked different, and you you noticed it. Yeah, um, Hummer was one of those cars. I remember going to the uh, the L A Auto Show. Um, back when the Hummer came out and I remember sitting in this car in this, in this truck in the, in the, in the, in the show and just thinking, you know, gosh, would this be the coolest thing to just, you know, turn on the motor and just drive through the, the convention center and, and down on the streets of LA as people are fleeing as you're, as you're going. It's, 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 it's a car. It's a car that I, I think you'd want to rent or drive for a day, but I, I, I can't imagine owning one. Yeah, <laughs> but my God, what a, what a, what a presence! Yeah, for real, it's a car where you you know you sit in the driver's seat and you reach your arm out, and the passenger reaches their arm out, and you guys can't touch each other. You know, it's huge. Yeah. But um, yeah, they definitely are fun. Just maybe not the most practical car, and but I love that. I didn't realize that um, Arnold like almost single handedly got that into the the hands of the public. That's cool. And if you watch that movie Predator, you, you'll you'll see the scene where a few Hummers are in the background, and you can see that right there is the uh, is the spark that created that brand right in that mm-hmm. moment in that movie. Didn't they? I think they had he had like a because um, once he became governor, then he was um, you know very uh, conscious of the uh, environment and everything like that. So I think they made him like an electric or a hybrid version Hummer at once, like a special one off one for him to drive around. I, th- I think they did. I'd, he- I'd, I'd heard that. I'd never, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that that's the case. That may just be a, 
a story. But I know that that um, that Schwarzenegger had a collection of Hummers. He had at one time seven Hummers. Uh, but when he became governor of California, of course, California is not uh, is much more of an environmentally conscious place, and so he was forced to uh, to get rid of some of his Hummers. So he, uh, I know, he sold them off for charity auctions and things like that. But I had heard something about it, an electric, especially made electric one. That may well be true. Mm-hmm. Seems like something he would he would get going for him, you know. Um, so, OK, so on your site, you have you kind of have like these different eras of like the different ages of these orphan cars where, yeah. you know, 1974 to 83, it was um you know, kind of the oil embargoes and different government regulations kind of changed. They, they made, they shaped the cars of that era. So like people came out with like super, you know, the micro car and you have like the freeway car on here and stuff. I find that stuff. So it's very interesting how, you know, if all of a sudden the, we're all worried about saving gas and oil, then you know, a new car maker might come up with something to fit right in there, you know? Well, it's it's interesting. You you mentioned the freeway. Um, That's a car. I I didn't, I did not know about the freeway until last week. Um, (laughs) Over the last week, I'm not, I'm not even sure how to coming. I was, I was looking at an auction website and there was a freeway that came on, uh, came online, came on uh, up for auction. I said, what the heck is this? And it was a car that, that was built, um, in, from 1980 to 82, and if you remember, in 1979 there was a uh, the Iranian uh, the Iranian Revolution and uh, the subsequent oil embargo, um, and so entrepreneurs were scrambling to build uh, to create fuel efficient cars, and one of them was this the freeway, and uh, and we were in a recession, so it was a it was a minimalist car. And I, the freeway had. One seat, one door, one headlight, and it was powered by a one-cylinder engine. So I, I don't think you can get more more minimalist than that. Yeah, really. But uh, it uh, and they, but they sold. Uh, it was essentially a snowmobile with wheels and a, a fully enclosed body, um, and it sold for uh, you know a few thousand dollars. It was inexpensive. It was economical. It was uh, got gotcha you around town. Could actually do sixty miles an hour and get about sixty miles per gallon, uh, but it was a, a a a bit too minimal for Americans, and uh, they only sold seven hundred of them before they went out of business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like something about there's always people have always tried to come out with like a three wheel car, but it seems like the three wheeler has just never caught on for some reason. No, it does seem like cars are meant to have four wheels. Yeah. Um, yeah, but but it, it, it there and it, there's an inherent uh, uh, stability problem with three wheels. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, do you think was fascinating with new ways to make a, a more efficient car? I think um, I think most of the entrepreneurs that created these three wheelers or these uh, mini cars are uh, had Henry Ford was probably one of their heroes growing up, um, and they see the the success of a minimalist car like the, uh, like the model T, but we don't live in a world that, that, uh, that appreciates minimalism anymore. Yeah. But they come back again. There'll always be, there'll always be entrepreneurs are out there, out there who want to try that same formula again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There always is. I was just at it like in a little electric car show kind of pop-up thing. It was pretty small in, in El Segundo, um, near LA here. And there was, uh, this guy had a new, his three wheel car that he made, his company was making three wheel electric cars that sat one person. It, it looks like super similar to this freeway thing, you know, where it's just, a, it's like a, it's like an enclosed motorcycle, you know, it's not very big. Um, so was that, was that, go ahead. Was that called the Elio? I think there's a, there's a car, there's a three wheel car out there called the Elio. That's, uh, they keep, uh, announcing that it's going to be up, uh, that's going to be up for sale next year. And, Next year happens, and it's uh, then they say, "Well, it's the following year." And, and <laughs> problem with getting funding, or <laughs> yeah, the Elio. But, let's see, E L I O. Um, e L I O out of Phoenix, Arizona. That might have been them. Let's see. Um, no, this looks different. This thing is. I'm looking at a photo of it now. It kind of has like. 
I don't know. This might have been it. Who knows? Whatever. There's always somebody trying that stuff, but yeah. And they're always with it. Yeah. I, I think the, the thing about the cars, you know, there's the cars are out there. It's a romantic uh, business to be in, and and entrepreneurs want to see their name in chrome, as it were. <laughs> um, that's been the allure since uh, since uh, since Ford, uh, since Henry Ford uh, signed his name on on a blue oval mm-hmm. um, ten years ago. Yep, totally. So, is it really the only the only um car maker who's been kind of able to disrupt, you know, the big three has been Tesla in, in at least in recent memory, I guess. Right. You know, Tesla, um, you know, I, I, I say what you will about Elon Musk. Um, he's a damn smart guy and he seems to be doing it. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, was early. I, when Tesla first came out, I, I, I bought some stock in that company and, uh, when it doubled and then doubled again, I said, great, this, he can't sustain this and sold it. <laughs> and it doubled and doubled and doubled again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, he does look like he's going to make it with this, uh, with this mod, this new model three. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I, we spoke earlier about the model X, the, uh, the gold wing model. I think he calls it Falcon wing yeah. uh, model SUV. Gosh, if that's not a cool car, uh, my daughter goes to this, uh, School where there's a there's a few uh, there's a few wealthy folks who are uh, who are uh, her classmates and uh, classmates parents and there's a couple of them and I've I've seen that thing and it's just extraordinary to watch. Um, you know, these little uh, you know, these little sixth graders are piling into this uh, you know one hundred fifty thousand dollar car. <laughs> it's uh, and he is he's he sold it and he's uh, it's I, I give him credit for that. Yeah. I took a trip down to. Uh, to LA, you down your way for Thanksgiving, and you know there weren't too many car carriers on the road. Uh, there weren't any car carriers on the road except for uh, ones carrying Tesla Model Threes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, he said that he's going to build a half a million of them a year. And gosh, it looks like he might actually do it. Yeah, it's crazy because you know it's sort of all these new new car companies that entrepreneurs kind of bring up, they have sort of uh, something that makes them unique and different from, you know, they have their unique selling point. Like the, the Bricklin was super safe. The Tucker was super safe. Um, you know, these three wheel cars are very economical and small and easy to get around with and stuff, but they just, you know, they haven't been able to kind of get them into the mainstream or get the technology right or all this stuff. But um, Elon did it. He came in with, uh, you know, the electric car existed, but he, you know, he really made it a lot better and was able to bring, you know, his unique thing was the electric car. And he's been able to do what pretty much none of these other car entrepreneurs have been able to do. Well, the electric car has been around for a long, long time. Uh, when the, when the automobile first, uh, when the automobile was first invented, most of the many of the first automobiles were were electric powered, and up until the first first decade in the, in the of the twentieth century. Um, wait, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Oh, sorry, something's going wrong here. Um, let me get this. Uh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, where was I? Yes. Yeah, so the um, the first the, the first decade of the twentieth century. Century, um, it was still undecided whether uh, the automobile going forward would be powered by electricity, gasoline, or steam. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it wasn't until uh, <clears throat> it wasn't until um, technology for uh, an electric starter um, that, that made starting a gasoline powered car um, much more simple that uh, that the gasoline won the won the race. But up until 1912, really. Um, it, was, it was electric was the way mo- possibly more cars were powered uh, by electricity than by gasoline. Huh. Uh, but ga- uh, electric cars were limited by their uh, by their range. They could ne- no electric car could do more than uh, fifty miles on a charge, mm-hmm. uh, and that would go down significantly as you the speed or uh, if you're going faster or you're going up a hill. Um, and that technology didn't change until. Um, really, just ten years ago, with the with the Tesla, uh, with the nickel uh, 
the, I guess you call it the nickel uh, uh, battery, um, which oh, could yeah. hold the charge for much longer. Um, and so a Tesla has a range of uh, 200 to 300 miles. And and that was always the, the that was always the, the, the sticking point for electricity um, until they could reach that uh, technological threshold. Uh, electric, electric cars were never going to make it, but now it's possible. Yeah, that's now, interesting. I didn't realize that even back then they had a range of you know fifty miles, and you know in the nineties and stuff we were getting you know that's what electric cars were still getting. There hadn't been any real improvements on that. No, not at all. Huh. Um, until that sort of quantum leap of, uh, of technology, yeah, um, and we'll see about Tesla. I mean, the the the, the you know the, the story is still being told there. Um, we'll see how it how it goes when uh, when Mercedes or BMW or Ford or Nissan, um, General Motors, um, as they come out with their electric cars, will Tesla be still be able to maintain its edge? Mm-hmm. And totally. We'll see. We'll see. It may end up being a a make that didn't make it, but I suspect it won't. It's just a, it's also a cool name too. Yeah. You go back to uh, you know Mr. Tesla back uh, you know 100 200 years ago was the uh, was the um, crazy founder of uh, what was it was it DC AC current. Uh, so he was a uh, it, so that that it's, it's an excellent brand name. Mm-hmm. Uh, Very much so. Yeah, it is. I'm excited to see what happens because they are definitely they have. I mean, they've already changed the car industry. Um, I think it was, uh, what is it, the owner of, uh, the president of Chevrolet said that it was because of the uh, Tesla Roadster, the original one, that that's the reason they made the the Chevy Volt and the Chevy Bolt and everything was because, you know, the startup was able to make a such a good electric car that they, they should be able to do it too. So it's pretty cool to see the change that he is making, even if the, you know, even if the company doesn't make it, he's he's definitely changed a lot. At least for now, we'll see. And that that original Roadster uh, that Tesla made, I think it was in two thousand and six. He came up with that. It was uh, it was a basically a Lotus. Um, That's right. And yeah. He bought the rights to uh, produce the Lotus. He took out the engine and just stuffed in um, twenty or thirty. I forget the exact number of uh, basically batteries from laptop computers um, in the <laughs> chassis of the car. And powered it and made this just amazingly cool little roadster. Yeah, man, that's cool. That's such a that's so funny. And, but it wasn't until the Model S that uh, that really did it. I remember the first time I saw a Model S on the street. Um, I guess it was uh, uh, I guess it was uh, four years ago now. Uh, five what was this? Two thousand eighteen was two thousand twelve. They came out with the Model S. And to look at that car at the time, it was just, it was such an extraordinary design. And I, I thought that it was, it was like a, it was like an iPhone on wheels, mm-hmm. that, a, a machine that was so extraordinarily beautiful to look at. You just wanted to touch it. Yep. And, you know, and it's, you know, it really, it's held up. I got to give them credit for it. The designers of that car, that uh, the looks have held up. It's mm-hmm. a beautiful machine. Very much. Yeah. And that. Inside with the just one huge touchscreen. Um, I mean, that's becoming more and more. But when it came out, especially that wasn't very common. So that was like made it feel very, very futuristic iPhone esque. So that was, you know, I think that was a big draw towards it too. And the online updates, so you can increase the power. I think with a Tesla, I think you can you, know, you buy a Tesla now, um, and you decide you want more power or more range. You just uh, you just pay for it, and they download it into your, directly into your car, yeah. which is extraordinary. It's so extraordinary. Cool. Yeah, it's crazy. How they, but it's like uh, my cousin just bought a new GMC truck, and you know, as much as Tesla does that with the free updates, and they don't even have model years and everything, like still with GMC and their uh, you know on board whatever it's called, their navigation and stuff. If he wants to get like live traffic updates and all this kind of stuff, he has to pay like a monthly fee to get that where it's just like, I don't know. It just seems like the old, like they're just kind of holding on to the old model where Tesla is just doing free over the air updates, all this stuff. And they're, I'm just glad they're around it seems because they're, I think they're going to force the whole industry to be more, more, technologically up to date, I guess. I don't know. 
I think you're right. And I think if, uh, if the industry doesn't adapt to what they're doing, um, I'll have some more brands to write about in the future. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. Um, okay, I wanted to, I was reading about the, uh, the what was it, the Willie's Overland brand on your, on your website. So I was hoping we could talk about that a little bit because that is a cool story. Yeah, Willis Overland, um, which um, Willis Overland was the the maker of the of the iconic Jeep um, during World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it had been around for quite a bit longer. Um, it had been around since 1903, um, and they did quite well for a while until the Great Depression hit, and they they went bankrupt, um, and they came out of bankruptcy. Uh, a much much weaker company, um, and they'd started to build the company back and build their production facilities back. But it wasn't until World War II broke out when the U.S. government needed a, a light reconnaissance vehicle. Um, a small, a, a tiny little company from Pennsylvania called American Bantam uh, created this light reconnaissance vehicle for for the use for the Army uh, that the Army liked. Um, but American Bantam didn't have the production facilities to build the um, nearly a million uh, Jeeps that, that the Army was going to require. So they put the bids out, and, and uh, Willis Overland bid on it and, and won that bid. And then the president of Willis uh, Overland um, patented the name. And it became known as uh, the U.S. Army Jeep. Uh, I think the soldiers had given it the nickname, the Jeep. Huh. And the president of uh, Willis Overland um well, hey, that's pretty cool. Let me copyright that name. So he went down to the, co- the patent office in 1942 and copyrighted the name Jeep. Um, and so a number of manufacturers were building Jeeps for the Army. But when the war ended, um, it was Willis Overland that had the patent for that name. And so they uh, were the ones to uh, uh, put uh, sell it to the to uh, uh, sell it to the uh, uh, individual customers um, in 1946. Uh, and so that Jeep, you know, and why is Jeep on a, on, on a site called makes that didn't make it Jeep is probably one of the more iconic, uh, iconic brands, uh, in existence today, <clears throat> but the company that made Jeep, uh, uh, d- didn't survive, uh, it was bought out by, um, bought out by Kaiser. We talked about earlier, mm-hmm. uh, and Kaiser was bought out by American motors, uh, and American Motors was then purchased by uh, Renault of France, uh, who then sold it to Chrysler Corporation, uh, and now it's in the hands of, uh, of Fiat. Um, the companies that that owned Jeep uh, weren't worth a whole lot when they were purchased, but they were purchased because uh, other companies wanted that Jeep brand. Hmm. Uh, and I would say that uh, I, we'd be hard pressed to to uh, come up with a more iconic brand than uh, than Jeep, mm-hmm. uh, and it was the uh, it was the product of, of Willis Overland. So yeah, yeah, it's just a, I like that story. It's cool and it is so iconic. With just you just see like um, like the two headlights with like the you know the ten lines or whatever for the grill. That is it just like that iconic Jeep look that they still have in all of their cars today. Like they're they're very different, but it still has that same look, which I love. You can always identify a Jeep. Yep, totally. Yeah, I have the uh, the Jeep uh, Patriot, the older one. I don't think they make it anymore, but mm-hmm. I feel like it was kind of the last, besides the Wrangler, kind of the last Jeep to have that real jeep look they still sort of have it but it's more of a modern squished down face and everything that i'm not a super fan of but uh i do love my patriot that thing is fun you can still get that you can still get that wrangler which has the uh the original dna of the of the u.s army jeep from uh from world war ii Mm -hmm. yeah it's great and like it hasn't even changed that much the older ones like you can tell the difference and they i think they did just go through a body style change but if you didn't, you you really have to look to see what they change. All they do is like move a couple little things so that the people who love Jeeps are going to buy new ones. But they just they just keep that same style and look because it's just so good. It's crazy how a car is able to do that. It's true. It just looks like it's 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 evolution at its best. Yeah. 
you know, going back to that that orphan car show that I, I went to last year, um, you know, there was a there was a 1946 uh, uh, civilian Jeep uh, there, and to to look at that original Jeep and to see how tiny that 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 vehicle is compared to the the new Wrangler, you know, with the f- four doors, and uh, it's 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 incredible. You, you see how much that vehicle has changed, yet as you say, it's still you can still identify it instantly for what it is. Uh huh. Yeah, I didn't realize it was so much, um, so much smaller. Even then, like the even if you get a newer two door one, is it were the uh, you know ones from the fifties and stuff still a lot smaller? It really is, and I, I I've seen pictures of, of them side by side, and it looks like uh, you can almost fit two of the old jeeps into the new uh, four door Wrangler. <laughs> Interesting, weird. Yeah, cars are just getting bigger, I guess. Same with the Mini Cooper, like. Uh, you know, when they revive that to the new minis, the now they're just they're like almost twice the size. They're so much bigger than the original minis were. But um, well, so really, my, my wife has a a 2015 Mini Cooper, uh-huh. and uh, and if you compare it, <laughs> actually, I saw a uh, I saw a uh, uh, an original Mini uh, from the 60s, and uh, in a parking lot, and I parked my wife's uh, my wife's Mini Cooper next to it, and got a picture of it. And it is, and it almost looks twice the size, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's still, crazy. Like, like the Jeep, it's still, you can still identify it as a Mini. Yeah, that's true. That's another one that's, that is kind of the same. That uh, hasn't changed the style much, even though they have added a bunch of new models and they're trying to make like the smaller crossover size and everything. It's, they still look the same. They still look super similar. It is. And that original Mini Cooper, that was a, it wasn't called, it was just called the Austin Mini. Uh, when it came out in 1959, that was a that was a, that 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 changed the way cars were built forever. That was like a groundbreaking car because it was the first car that that was commercially successful that used a transverse mounted uh, front wheel drive, uh, which allowed for so much more interior space. Uh, but, but by not having to have the transmission, uh, the drive shaft go through the, uh, the 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 passenger compartment. Oh, so. And really, every car now that has front wheel drive now um, pays homage in some way to uh, that original 1959 Mini Cooper. Okay, wait. So, what what was different about it? Can you explain that again? So prior to prior to the Mini, the original Mini, uh-huh. uh, cars were a front engine and a, a rear and a rear drive. So the yeah. drive shaft would go from the from the engine to through the center of the car through the interior cabin right or underneath the interior cabin to the rear wheels to drive the rear wheels and uh so in 1959 they uh um an englishman by the name of i don't even think i can pronounce his name it's sir alec uh iglesias i think it is that's not the way to pronounce it something like that Uh, (laughs) he's a a wonderful engineer an eclectic engineer and he said hey why don't we just turn the engine sideways and have a uh and power the front wheels so the engine intrudes in no way intrudes into the passenger compartment that way you can make a much smaller car a, a small car have a tremendous amount of room uh-huh. and he, when the car was introduced in 1959 it was an incredible hit and uh they built it for another uh i think the last mini the last original mini was made in 73 so that was uh, 15 years of building them mm-hmm. okay so millions of them yeah I didn't realize that Mini was the first one to really do that because that seems – that is very common now. Now, there may have been cars before that but that, that had done it, but it was the first one that was commercially successful. Right. Okay. Wow, cool. And I, I – put, put that in. What was that? No, that's – oh, what okay. were you going to say? Well, I, I don't know if this is true, but I've, I this might be you know rumor or lore or whatever, but I heard that they got the basic size and shape for the Mini by – they just put four, you know, regular like dining chairs down on the on a large piece of paper and sat four people in it and just put them as close together as they could kind of comfortably fit. And then just he drew a square around it. And then that was the uh, the shape for the interior of the of the mini. That was the size of it. That's true. That's a true story. And it's uh, and it's minimalist at its best, isn't it? Yeah, it is very cool. Those are fun. Um. Okay, so now I'm looking. I'm on your site right now, and I'm looking at this uh, car called the uh, Survival. 
Now the survival. Yes, that's a, you know, I, I ran across that car. I, I found that was, a, that was a, that was actually uh, one of the first, uh, I used to call it one of the first safety cars. It was 1958. Um, it was, uh, it was a fellow from Waltham, Massachusetts, an engineer from Waltham, Massachusetts had, uh, had heard somehow that since the, at that time, since the beginning of the automobile, uh, one million people collectively had uh, been killed in traffic accidents um, at that time in 1959, 58. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we decided to build a safety car that would eliminate uh, traffic fatalities. So we decided to come up with, if you see the picture, it's hard to talk about this without having a picture in front of you, but he decided to create this, this bi, a bisectional car. And so if you look at that picture, You've got uh, there's a front section and a rear section. The front end, the front section holds the engine, and it was it and it's 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 designed so that um, in a frontal collision, the front end would pivot and absorb the uh, the the uh, the impact, uh, protecting the passengers who are in the rear section of the car. And uh, and if you look at that crazy looking car, it basically looks like a some sort of giant. Um, atomic age mutant beetle <laughs> and uh, for some reason no one wanted to buy it <laughs> uh, especially when it cost about three times as much as a regular car yeah and uh, th th i'm pushing the envelope a little bit with that car I, th I put that on the site they only made one of them um, oh okay but i should tell automotive make uh i think you need to have uh three you have to produce three cars three of the same cars to be considered a, a, a model. Mm -hmm. um, but gosh, if you look at it, how can I not resist writing a story about that one? Yeah. This thing, for anybody listening, it's worth checking this thing out. Just search survival, S-I-R dash V-I-V-A-L, because this thing is crazy looking. And it's the whole, it looks like a, like a bumper car almost, because the whole thing is surrounded by, you know, air filled rubber bumpers, it says. Yes. And it's got a, uh, and it's got a uh, uh, a separate uh, uh, the driver. Um, there's a separate driver and passenger compartment. So the driver sits up above in like a uh, in like its own his own little uh, little command module. Um, and the fellows, uh, the engineers, uh, his idea behind that was that so the driver would just drive and he would have better visibility up there, but he also wouldn't be distracted by talking to passengers. <laughs> Oh, okay. I see. Um, I, I I would have liked to have met this fellow. I don't think he's alive anymore. But that was an interesting idea. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's actually one of the more popular of of, uh, of my pieces, and I'm I'm I guess it's because uh, I know if somebody stumbles on it, apparently they occasionally somebody will stumble on it, and then they'll post it on Facebook, and then people will uh, will have a look. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, uh, I was not quite expecting that when I wrote about the, the piece. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just such a fun car. I love, I love that the guy just like, you know, he was just concerned about the safety of cars. So he went out and made his own thing that was just like crazy and kind of ridiculous. And like, who would want to sit by themselves without their passenger there? And, you know, but he didn't care. He just made his own thing to the, to what he thought was the best car and the safest car, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Well, man, this is fun talking about this stuff. I think we have to, we'll kind of wrap it up here. We've been, this, I love just talking about all these different stories, but there's so many, but I think we should talk about just DeLorean a bit. Cause I feel like that might be the most famous orphan car, um, at least for people of my generation and stuff with back to the future and, and knowing the, the DeLorean, you know? Well, it's interesting. And since you had a Brooklyn, and yes. uh, the Brooklyn came along uh, six years, about half a dozen years before the uh, the DeLorean. And uh, the DeLorean was created by a by a former General Motors executive uh, named John John DeLorean. And jo John DeLorean in the fifties was the chief engineer for Pontiac, um, and uh, he really uh, changed that. He turned that brand around. General Motors was actually considering a. a uh, eliminating Pontiac and De DeLorean uh, revitalized the the cars. Uh, he was the the father of the uh, of the GTO, the Pontiac oh. GTO. 
yeah. which is considered to be the original muscle car. Mm-hmm. Um, he uh, created the Firebird. Um, he moved on to Chevrolet, where he uh, created the the uh, uh, not created the second generation Camaro. Uh, he was um, in line to be, and he wanted to be president of General Motors, but he was a, a flamboyant fellow. He liked to hang out with Holly, the Hollywood elites, and he was married to a fashion model, and he wanted to do things his way. And General Motors is a very uh, is a very conservative, old fashioned company, especially back in the in the in the nineteen seventies. Uh, so they fired him, and he s- went on to start his own car. Well, before he before he actually started his own car company, he went and did, had a consulting gig with Brooklyn. Oh, I didn't realize and that. He became fascinated with that the idea of a gull winged car. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he actually took that that consulting gig and and turned it into his own car company. Now he did it in a little different a different way. That was a the DeLorean was a, a rear engined a rear engine car. Um, but it had a lot of, uh, a lot of parallels with, uh, with Brooklyn. Um, uh, DeLorean, uh, was an entrepreneur again. He had this, he was scrambling for funds. Uh, so he went to the, uh, the British government and, uh, and he got them to finance a factory in Northern Ireland, uh, to build the Brooklyn. But much like, uh, Malcolm Brooklyn had, uh, built his Brooklyn in, uh, Nova Scotia, uh, because the Nova Scotia government gave him uh, subsidies. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nova Scotians didn't know how to build cars. Uh, well, the people of Northern Ireland didn't know how to build cars either. Um, and so <laughs> both both cars were, were plagued with quality problems. Uh, DeLorean was more successful than Brooklyn in that uh, Brooklyn sold 3,000 cars and DeLorean sold about 14,000 over, over three years. Um, and... Uh, where Brooklyn was uh, special in it, it was uh, it was a plastic bodied car. Uh, DeLorean uh, was a uh, stainless steel car, and uh, but the difference, the other difference is Steven Spielberg uh, decided that uh, ah stainless steel, that we could use that for our movie, and mm-hmm. uh, and and it was because it was a stainless steel car that it uh, could. Have the translux capacitor. Was that what it was called? The translux capacitor. The uh, the flux capacitor. And uh, and of course that uh, uh, that made the Brooklyn um, that made the Brooklyn famous. Mm-hmm. Couldn't you couldn't you couldn't buy a publicity like that? But too bad the movie came out uh, ten years after Brooklyn was out of business. Yeah, that's so true. It was it was like too late that it kind of came back into into pop culture. You know. But by gosh, you know, like I said, the, when we started the conversation, uh, Brooklyn's are going for about 15000 but uh, DeLoreans are crossing the gavel at uh, twenty five to 50000 bucks. Mm-hmm. So, totally. Uh, yeah. And they, someone, um, I'm not sure, I think it's just some entrepreneur, some, you know, businessman bought uh, the DeLorean name and the, you know, the business, everything that was left over from when they went under. They had a bunch of old stock ready to build cars that just hadn't been you know, assembled yet. And now they're creating them again. So they're basically creating new DeLoreans now that you can buy. Um, they're not releasing them yet. Yeah. There's some federal regulation, I guess, where they're going to be allowed to sell like 200 cars a year or something like that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty cool. That's, that's going to be exciting to see, you know, a 2019 DeLorean on the, on the streets, you know? Well, you're essentially buying a, a 1982, uh, DeLorean, uh, mm-hmm. But it's called the 2019. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that that legislation haven't, hasn't passed yet, but it, it looks like it's going to. Yeah, that's that's gonna be fun to be able to have uh, cars like that. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I think they're doing because the DeLorean wasn't. I mean, it was underpowered, but there was nothing. You know, was there anything really wrong with it? Why did the company go under? Was it just because of more because of John DeLorean, all the stuff that happened with him? Well, he was, um, you know, it, it, it was like many entrepreneurs, they, they, it, it, you, you run out of funds and, uh, your funding is, is tight. And DeLorean, when he ran out of, uh, when he ran out of money, he decided to, uh, to find, you know, the old story, he decided to finance his company by selling, trying to buy and then resell, um, 55 pounds of cocaine. Um, and when he got you know, caught, I think, 
I think he beat that charge, but uh, but the company had gone out of business by then. Yeah. Uh, but the DeLorean was a, it was it was a, it was an expensive car. Uh, entrepreneurs, of course, are, are optimistic souls, and uh, they think they can you know build a car for I think at the time a DeLorean was supposed to cost twelve thousand bucks, which was less than a Corvette. Um, but by the time I actually built it, it was, of course, more than a Corvette, and it was much, much less horsepower, and uh, and, and had trouble selling it. Uh, yeah. Plus, quality problems and the difficulties with their labor force, and uh, it's it's it takes so much capital to to start a car company. Um, and it's it's a terribly difficult business to be in. And uh, you need a, a, a tremendous amounts of money, and uh, most people just don't. And they underestimate what it's going to take to be successful in that business. Mm -hmm. Lorraine was one of those people. Malcolm Bricklin was one of those people. Preston Tucker was one of those people. Yep. Yeah, it's just such a. There's such an allure. It would. Yeah, like you said, to get your name on that badge of the of the car, because literally almost all these the inventor the you know the founder named the car after themselves yes yeah <laughs> like that's funny like i never henry realized ford. that yeah like henry ford yeah, exactly yeah they all just want their name on it because it is it would be pretty cool to have a car company with your name you know although elon musk didn't name his car the musk <laughs> probably a good probably Which a good a move good, yeah good idea yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> Dang. Well, Malcolm, this is so fun to talk to you about all this stuff. I love, you know, hearing all these stories. This stuff is so interesting to me. So I'm glad you have the site and are documenting this for everybody to read and, and not forget these stories, you know? Well, Travis, I appreciate you having me on. I, I, uh, I think of myself much more as a writer than a talker. So uh, please have a look at this site. I, uh, I, I'm glad you enjoy it. I enjoyed meeting you and talking with you. Yes. Sorry I can actually... You, we can't actually see each other with our little Skype problems here, but yeah, no, no worries. We got, we got it worked out. Audio's audio's perfect. So this, this was fun. Um, so why don't you just tell everybody, uh, you know, where they can find you, your, your website address. And then if you have any other social media or anything you want people to check out. No, I just have the website. It's called, uh, it's called the makes that didn't make it www.makes that didn't make it.com. And uh, it's not as a commercial site. I don't have any ads. I just uh, it's just a place to go to learn about old cars and to read stories about old cars. Perfect. Yeah, I definitely recommend anybody checking it out. It is fun just to read through all these things. So cool. Well, I'll uh, I'll link to that in the in the show notes for all this stuff, so people can just click on that and go right to the to your website and check it out. But uh, yeah, and, and Travis, the, the best of luck with your new with your new podcast. Oh, I thank you. Hearing it. Um, whether I make it on or not, I look forward to listening to it because you, you seem like a fascinating fellow. I like what you're doing. Awesome. Well, thank you, man. Appreciate that. All right. Man. Go take care of those dogs. All right. Yeah. You too as well. Thanks, man. Okay. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, guys. Travis is here again. Um, so the podcast is over. It's done. So you can just leave right now. So don't worry about it. But I just had a couple things I wanted to mention and say to you guys. So first of all, thanks for listening to the episode or watching the episode. Super appreciate that. Um, if you want to connect with me or in, in the podcast, uh, we're on, we have a website. It's called curiosityness.com. Um, curiosityness is C-U-R-I-O-S-I-T-Y-N-E-S-S. -S -S. Kind of weird. Um, but that's what it is. Curiosityness.com. Uh, you can go there. We have an Instagram Instagram.com slash curiosityness podcast. So not just curiosityness for the username. Uh, I'm on Instagram as Trav DeRose, T R A V D E R O S E, if you want to find just me. Um, oh, we're on Facebook, Facebook.com slash curiosityness. We're on YouTube. Uh, I think just go to YouTube and search curiosityness and we'll pop up. Uh, I don't think we have a URL for that one. Sorry. Oh, and we have a I have an email address, Travis at curiosityness.com. So if you want to email me, you know, give me your thoughts on the show, suggestions, tips, uh, maybe like a suggestion for a new for a guest who could come on, maybe yourself or somebody that you know who might be interested or 
or you would like to hear on the podcast, let me know about that stuff. I, I would love to hear that. Um, oh, and then if you could leave a review too for the podcast, that'd be super appreciated. Uh, the reviews in like in Apple Podcast or Spotify or whatever, wherever you're listening to this, super help. Um, just drop like a star, whatever star review. I won't tell you to do five, but it'd be nice. Uh, so drop a review. You can write a review even too if you want. That would be even better. Um, but that's about it. So thanks again for watching. I super appreciate you, you know, listening to the whole show and staying here. Um, and yeah, thanks again. Have a good day. Bye bye.